Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, today, we're happy to have you join us for this webinar on BlackRock Gold Corp. My name is Jacob Willoughby and I'm a Vice President of Research and Analyst at Right Cloud Securities Incorporated. Joining me remotely today are Andrew Pollard, President and CEO, and Bill Howell, Executive Chairman of BlackRock Gold. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation on the company from Andrew and Bill, followed by a question and answer period. As a reminder, you can type in your questions at any time, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. But before we begin, I'd like to note that there may be some forward-looking statements made in this webinar, and I would direct listeners to the cautionary notes on page two of Black Rock Gold's corporate presentation. The presentation is located on the website and is the presentation you will see today. For Red Cloud Securities Incorporated, I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. Also, we note that this webinar does not take into account a particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Company-specific disclosures for Red Cloud are the following. In the last 12 months preceding the date, issuance of the research report or recommendation, Red Cloud Securities Incorporated has performed investment banking services for the issuer. Also in the last 12 months, a partner director or officer of Red Cloud Securities Incorporated or the analyst involved in the preparation of the research report has received compensation for investment banking services from the issuer. Lastly, the issuer has also entered into a service and advisory agreement with Red Cloud Securities. And now I'm very happy to introduce to you Andrew Pollard, President and CEO, and Bill Hallow, Executive Chairman of BlackRock Gold. Uh, thanks very much, Jacob. Uh, what a buzzkill, though. My goodness. Let's also <laughs> let's have some fun here today, guys, because it's been a very fun week for everyone. And um, uh, I'm, I'm glad that Jacob and 200 or so of his closest friends are uh, invited in Bill in our uh, living room. Um, I'm just going to go about sharing my screen here. As 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 Jacob had said, uh, we're uh, it, it's going to be Bill and I uh, consider myself the opening act um, because uh, I'm going to quickly take you through a slide deck and then I'm going to pass the baton over to Bill uh, to take you through the model because it's one thing hearing it, but it's another thing seeing in 3D exactly what we're targeting and, and that's really the most exciting part of the story. Uh, so here I go, um, uh, share, oh. uh, sorry, okay, and here we go. All righty. Okay. So, uh, if, uh, Jacob, could you confirm that's coming through? We're good to go. Okay. Yes, it's all good. Awesome. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'm Andrew Pollard with BlackRock Gold. Uh, for those that, of you that don't know, uh, we're traded on, under the symbol BRC on the venture. We also have a listing on the OTC under BKRRF. Uh, I was just informed before we came on that there's a German listing for us as well. So if any of you guys are feeling daring, you can try that on the Frankfurt AHZ. Um, uh, here we go. As uh, Jacob said, yeah, we've got a lot to look forward here uh, uh, forward to today. Um, uh, so uh, it's it's been a pretty good week on our end. Um, not only has our share price uh, moved significantly, but I was also out yesterday and apparently I've gotten... Uh, a lot better looking since the last time I was at Cactus Club. So that's interesting too. Um, we've uh, gone on a wild run. Uh, you know, we're around a hundred million dollar uh, market cap as of uh, this morning. This snapshot was taken yesterday, so a little outdated, but um, uh, yeah, we've obviously got some significant momentum and uh, I'm going to tell you why. Uh, but, you know, one of the things um, that stands out anytime a company moves is, is are they ready for it? Um, when Bill and I joined the company last uh, May of 2019, it was about a million dollar market cap and trading at three cents. Bill and I didn't uh, join the company to run a million dollar market cap company and we didn't uh, join it to run a $50 million one. Uh, every single thing we've done ever since has been to position the company for this point. Uh, and that's, you know, we want to build something significant. 
Uh, we want to uh, have a team capable of seeing it move forward. And every single director, uh, and, and uh, it's the board has been completely changed out, uh, is a part of uh, companies where we're still the small potatoes of them. Um, so who is BlackRock? Well, uh, we're Nevada focused. Uh, if I could sum it up in two things, it would be we're focused on big grades and big ounces. We've got a portfolio of two projects. Um, I assume the reason most of you are here is to hear about one of them. Uh, the one thing in common that both of our projects have is we uh, found them both to be wildly overlooked uh, at the time we got them. We saw incredible value. Our, our Silver Cloud project in North Central Nevada uh, is what got Bill and I here in the first place. It's what got most of the board here in the first place. Uh, and we saw that as one of the most overlooked exploration opportunities uh, in the junior market. Um, it's 45 square kilometers right at the top of the Carlin trend, right where it intersects with the Northern Nevada Rift. So on one side, we've got uh, some of the largest open pit gold mines uh, on the planet and directly adjacent to us and a stone's throw away from us are some of the highest grade uh, mines in the world in the, that were uh, it, when they were operating in their heyday. Um, but what I'm gonna tell you about today is our Tonopah West project. Uh, Tonopah West is a project we picked up in February, went completely unnoticed by the market. Uh, the day we announced the transaction was the day the World uh, Health Organization uh, put out their first worldwide health emergency uh, notice. Uh, it was, uh, at that point, the single worst day in Dow history. It was immediately followed up two days in a row ever since. So we went from 20 cents, we got sold all the way down to about 7 cents on the back of that news over the uh, following month. We decided not to really market it too much at that point. Um, and around May 1st, when things uh, started really getting going again and we saw there was a bid, that's when we started telling people about it. And what were we telling people? Well. We were telling people that we just got half of one of the largest silver districts uh, historically in all of North America and the grades uh, that it's known for off the charts. Tonopah was one of the last um, district scale discoveries made in Nevada before World War I. Um, and it has a 50 year production profile uh, that averaged at about 50 gram per ton gold equivalent or uh, over two kilogram silver equivalent uh, over, over all the years of production. Um, now, I've heard that uh, registrations have really blown up since uh, we put some news out on Monday and that news was we drilled our first hole into Tonopah. Uh, that hole uh, was exactly as we modeled it would be. The market was surprised, Bill and I weren't. Uh, there was one surprise, we hit two other veins, but the vein we were targeting, uh, uh, we hit about 30 meters of uh, nearly a kilogram per ton silver equivalent. Um, to put that in perspective, that's about a six story building. Um, meaning if, if I were to try and run from one side to the other, I probably wouldn't make it. Um, now, the project itself, it's a consolidation, we control half of it, uh, uh, of this entire district, so the district itself is about uh, four miles wide east to west um, and we could we are by far the largest claim holder down there um, now the district itself uh, back in the day between 1900 and the heydays were between 1900 and 1930 uh, it produced 174 million ounces of silver nearly 2 million ounces of gold as I said at an average uh, silver equivalent of over two kilos per uh, per ton um, and uh, then it, it just fell off everyone's radar. Why? Well, because early uh, 20th century was about as tumultuous a time as uh, there could be. Silver prices went from about a dollar uh, down to 35 cents in about five years. Uh, and uh, with World War I, costs escalated. Uh, talent uh, was hard to find. Um, and of course, the Great Depression set in. And that was really what put the nail in the coffin of Tonopah. Uh, until now. Um, we're the first group to ever conduct modern uh, exploration on this uh, project. Um, no one's ever drilled into the historic workings ever before. In fact, uh, when the district was discovered, uh, there was no drilling done. They mined these veins straight from surface. They followed them down uh, uh, a long strike and down dip, and effectively um, uh, they uh, east-west trending district, the discovery was made on the east side and it moved westward. So the west side of the district is where the final um, production in the district took place prior to silver prices collapsing. You'll see a, you'll, you'll see a piece of uh, 
uh, well, this low sulfidation epithermal rock there, I mean, there's classic banded veins. This is the sort of stuff we're going to be, uh, well, we have drilled into so far, um, and we're targeting some serious upside. Now, another thing that makes Tonopa really unique is it's produced at 100 to 1 silver to gold ratio, making this a primary silver district, which, as many of you guys know, uh, is quite rare. Silver is normally a byproduct of other industrial metal mines, be it copper, lead, zinc. Um, this is a pure precious metal district. It's uh, not in the Yukon, it's not Alaska, it's not Peru, and it's not southern Mexico. This is halfway between Vegas and Reno, and we're talking uh, grades that would make Einstein blush. Um, this is, it's not just me saying um, that this was a hell of a district. This is a newspaper clipping from the early 1900s, uh, effectively saying that Tonopah was uh, one of the most significant precious metals districts in the United States uh, at the time. Uh, what our property package consists of um, is it's multiple, it's not just, uh, it, it, it's multiple former uh, producing mining companies uh, projects all put together as one for the first time. We're not just drilling an exploration target, we're drilling into three historic mines plus a new discovery that was made by core mining. Um, why was this district uh, rated as one of the most significant precious metals district in the US? Here it is. Uh, the red line there indicates uh, the precious metals production profile in a gold equivalent basis. As you'll see from 1900 up until about 1915, uh, this thing was an absolute monster. Uh, uh, if there was a few years where it produced at over uh, 450,000 gold equivalent ounces per year. The grades, uh, as you'll see, those are the grades. They started off ultra high, and we're talking 10 kilograms silver equivalent high, because the grades at surface were, uh, sorry, the veins at surface were super gene enriched. I mean, there was um, uh, in, absolutely crazy, and then you'll see they leveled off as they went deeper, and then you'll see the average grades go below there. Um, this isn't really an exploration play, even though what we're hitting has surprised the market. It's, it's, it's part exploration, but a lot of it's just about the real estate consolidation. Um, this is a forgotten district, and it wasn't because of the potential. It was forgotten because uh, the vast majority of the claims here are patented, meaning they're privately owned, meaning back in uh, the 1900 when the district was discovered, uh, there was a limit to how many individual claims uh, could be staked at one point. Uh, there was lots of consolidation back then and then they kept falling back. And, and um, really the, the secret sauce for the last few decades has been consolidating a really good package of property to make it worthwhile and exploring. And, and that's what we've done here. When we signed this deal, this is the first, uh, it, it brought two individual parcels of uh, claims together for the first time ever, giving uh, us status to uh, being the largest claim holder in the district since Howard Hughes uh, controlled it in the mid 1960s. Um, these claims uh, uh, bring together, as I said, three historic producing mines, uh, probably more than that, we're targeting three historic producing mines. And then you'll see um, uh, some uh, other claims which uh, were uh, separately owned but brought together upon signing, um, of which core mining made a discovery on two years ago, hitting two veins, one averaging, uh, well, one hit 700 gram uh, silver and 10 gram gold, uh, and the other hitting about 10 gram gold equivalent, both of them being uh, about a meter and a half. So here's what we're drilling into right now. Um, we've got four target areas. Our first hole was hole one into the Victor target right here. Victor was uh, 24 meters thick uh, when the miners got turned around. They mined this. This is one of the most prolific producers in the district. It was mined uh, down to 1880 level, uh, and they got turned around there when two veins uh, uh, confluenced together. And when they, where they confluenced together, it was 24 meters thick. The issue was um, that uh, they encountered water, and this was in the 1920s. Well, pump technology isn't what it was. Uh, it, what, it has gotten a lot better back then. In fact, it was a very small amount of water they encountered, but uh, they were using electric pumps and electricity wasn't all that reliable. Um, so when they got turned around there, uh, the Tonopah Extension Mining Company, uh, uh, they, they reverted back and they went to target number two, which we've just completed some holes on as well. Uh, target number two represents the last uh, production in the entire district. Um, and that was uh, mined down to the 1650 level. In fact, they did a lot more development work on there, uh, but unfortunately in the mid-1920s, 
uh, was uh, when the Fed was created and when all these policies were brought in that saw precious metals absolutely tank. Um, you'll see uh, you'll see the town of Tonopah next to us. The town of Tonopah on the east side is is where the initial discoveries were made. Um, as I said before, the discovery uh, was made on the east side. It was actually made by a, a man named Jim Butler and his mule. Uh, and then it represented, uh, I guess, the last gold rush prior to World War I. Um, the town was built on top of uh, all the historic mines now. Um, but effectively what happened was it's an east-west trending district. Uh, the, uh, all the mines on the east side of town were mined out fairly early. I think um, uh, the last of them really hit their heyday in about 1915. And all uh, the companies started staking out to the west. And that's where they kept making these new discoveries. They weren't drilling back then. They were just doing drifts and cross cuts, uh, down strike and, and um, catching the veins. And at those grades, it, didn't, it wasn't rocket uh, science. Um, as I said, the West represents the blue sky. We're, we're drilling into three historic mines. And then there's a new discovery area. Uh, core mining had, um, uh, I guess, optioned uh, 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 the package of claims from Ely Gold Royalties. Uh, at the time, that was a greenfield, uh, uh, I guess, target that they were drilling into, and that's where they hit those veins. So we're also following up on those high-grade hits. Um, as I said, when CORE moved, uh, left the district, it was all following the Northern Empire acquisition, and they put all their resources into that. And then when we were uh, uh, able to get our hands on this package, Ely was also able to quarterback the second set of claims, which brought together all of the historic production that we're targeting into now. And um, uh, this is a, a photo, well, this is a section of the first target, which is the Victor vein. This was effectively hole one, uh, where we're just drilling down uh, uh, down dip of that 24 meter uh, thick vein that uh, where they got turned around. As I said, we weren't all that surprised that we hit that first intercept. What we were surprised on was that we found two uh, other veins uh, with grades, uh, uh, there was a three meter vein right above uh, that was over two kilogram per ton. Within that, uh, it had a 36 uh, kilogram per ton over meter and a half intercept. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was, uh, that was a nice surprise. In addition, we also hit a smaller three meter vein as well with about 465 grams. Our holes two and three are gonna focus on the down dip portion of this. We're gonna try and extend it by about 170 meters. In addition to do oriented core to uh, get a better sense of true width. This is also uh, the second target we've completed some holes into. Uh, as we said, this was mined down to about 1650 level. Uh, this is uh, projected to be the big kahuna of the project in terms of the tonnage. Hole one, uh, uh, target one was, uh, we project to be somewhere between half a, half a million tons to a million tons. Uh, target number two uh, is projected to be over 3 million, uh, well, up to 3 million tons. So. Um, buckle up for that one. Um, I guess the most exciting thing about the news release uh, beyond the intercept isn't the fact that uh, we hit these new veins and the fact that we confirmed our model in that one target. It's the fact that we said we've hit uh, completed six holes between targets one and two, and the vein system seems to be, uh, uh, well, connecting as modeled and as predicted. Um, so with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass over to Bill, and he's going to show you guys uh, the model specifically, uh, where, um, uh, yeah, it goes beyond the conceptual and maybe we can see in 3D what's going on. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, just start out here with a little bit of uh, <coughs> material from the beginning. Uh, this is uh, this is a map showing Nevada and uh, the major silver districts in Nevada. And uh, the saying goes that uh, the Comstock, which is here, uh, uh, made Nevada a state and, and put Nevada on a map, and the Tonopah district, which is here, uh, kept it there. Um, if you were, uh, you know, if you kind of try to equate what these uh, two districts are uh, mean uh, in today's terms, probably well over six hundred billion dollars worth of uh, wealth created by these two districts in in today's terms. So if you were, uh, you know, if you were over in California in Silicon Valley and uh, you wanted to go and create an app that would uh, find $600 billion, I'm pretty sure that you'd get on your scooter and in your Tesla and you'd come over the hill and you'd try to find uh, these two districts. So they're pretty significant, uh, even if you uh, bring them up into today's uh, terms with respect to uh, 
their value uh, and GDP of the nation. As uh, Andrew said, we're, we're not starting uh, with a blank sheet of paper. Um, we had a lot of information to uh, draw from uh, on the district. Um, here you can see this is a cross section through uh, the Victor vein, and you can see the square sets here from the underground mining. In this zone here, uh, the vein uh, was roughly uh, 24 meters thick, 80 feet wide, and uh, they tried to follow it down. And as Andrew alluded to, they ran into some water difficulties. And uh, part of the problem was uh, in about 19, uh, 1915, 1920, sometime in there, the, the town of Tonopah became, uh, they got electricity from the Tonopah California Electrical Company. And unfortunately, uh, the the kind of reliability of the power wasn't very good. So uh, the pumps would pump as long as the juice was going to them and they'd get everything dried out and then they'd have some kind of brown out or blackout. Of course, the pumps would shut off and the workings would fill. So they, they basically uh, stopped mining down here and they ordered some diesel pumps. Uh, in uh, in doing that, they started to go and, and look to the to the west and at some other veins, and uh, they started to uh, focus on uh, what's called the Denver Bermuda Paymaster veins. Again, as I said, we're, we're not starting with a clean sheet of paper. This is the 1880 level, and you can see the square sets uh, on the Victor vein, and it's just a matter of uh, following this thing uh, down dip or down plunge, which is basically off to the northwest here. Same thing in our target two. Um, we've seen this section before. Uh, these are the four veins in, in target two. This is the Merton vein, the Bermuda vein, the Paymaster, and the Denver vein. And what they did is they developed out to those along the, the 1650 level, which is uh, right in here. And uh, they basically uh, said, well, um, we're going to continue on. But uh, as Andrew said, they, they basically uh, uh, fell into the trap of uh, commodity prices fell off, uh, fell off a cliff. You can see here on the section, though, this is from uh, 1947 here. This section was made based on all the data, but uh, they call this probable ore between the 1650 and the 1880 level. So that's uh, some of the places we're targeting uh, on those veins is that uh, sweet spot between those two levels. This is some of the sampling that was done along the Denver vein uh, to come up with those ideas. These are all in ounces per ton, so uh, fairly good uh, silver values. Um, they didn't really assay for gold uh, because they they know or they knew that the, the ratio between silver and gold was 101. So if you got uh, 18 ounce silver, then uh, you, you must have uh, roughly uh, uh, that equivalent in. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do the math. Sorry. <laughs> this is why this is this is the technical uh, brain behind uh, the operation here. <laughs> point, point one eight, point one eight. That's not my forte. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that's kind of interesting, again, and we're not starting with a clean sheet of paper. Um, this was done in 1930 by Nolan. He went and mapped all of the underground workings in the district and put together this isometric drawing. So here's the uh, Victor vein uh, coming down here. You can see kind of the unique feature of the district, which is uh, these veins are steep on the north side and they roll over. They're quite flat and they dip uh, gently to the south. So this is the Ohio vein over here. So again, uh, we have a lot of information to start and uh, uh, start our targeting. And, and that's what uh, we've been able to do in quite rapid fashion. Again, Andrew showed you this. Uh, this is uh, one of the ore samples, but classic uh, quartz uh, carbonate banded vein. Some of these black sulfides here are, uh, you know, prior argyrite electrum and some other uh, uh, silver sulfa salts. But, uh, we see those in our drilling as black sulfides and, and the quartz veins. Okay, so uh, let's just look at our progress to date. Uh, this is the Victor area up here. Uh, we've completed three holes in that target, the Victor area. Uh, we've had some fairly uh, good results here in uh, hole one. We're gonna come back with uh, some core holes uh, and follow that up. Uh, this is area two. Uh, this is the Denver vein coming through here. Uh, both uh, both of these holes targeted high grade uh, between that 1650 and 1800 level. Um, here we're looking at something that was over uh, 3.5 kilos uh, that was uh, uh, sampled in in the sill of, of the vein, the Denver vein. 
and this that was is here and this is uh the bermuda vein out here uh once we get results back from here our, our thoughts are to try to extend these out this is roughly about a 800 meter step out and uh, we'll try to tag that that vein again uh, out here uh, to the west same thing with the paymaster and the bermuda vein down here, uh, we just uh, started drilling in what's called the new discovery area. Uh, here, core had uh, a hole with over 700 grams uh, silver and about 10 grams of gold. That was a follow-up of an older hole by Eastfields out of the late 90s. And uh, we're here to try to understand what's going on here. Uh, we've got a new, uh, slightly different concept than core and Eastfield had in that uh, we know that on the south side of the property, these veins tend to be flat and dipping to the south. So we're going to look at this vein like it's flat and dipping to the south and uh, see what we can do with it. Okay, so um, let's go out here and, and look at uh, our 3D model. Are you referring to yourself? Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is uh, our leapfrog model. Um, here's the town of Tonopah here. Uh, the blue area is the outline of our, our claim package. Um, the blue dots uh, show the various production shafts uh, on or near the property. And uh, what we're gonna do is uh, cut some sections through this. Okay, so there's the surface. Uh, here's our veins. Here's the merger vein, the Victor vein. There's that rollover into the Ohio and West End veins. Uh, these are some projections coming in of the Paymaster and the, the Merton vein over here. Um, here's uh, our shaft, the Cash Boy shaft, and you can see the underground workings. Uh, okay, so. Um, Here's our three holes that we completed, hole one, two, and three. We released uh, results on hole one, and I'm just gonna zoom into hole one so we can have a look at it. <clears throat> so there's our, our 30 meters, basically, uh, thick uh, uh, of about one kilo silver equivalent on the Victor vein. Here are those upper two veins. One was more gold rich. I'll call that the black rock gold vein, and this is the black rock silver vein up here. So those were previously uh, unknown. Uh, you can see the workings coming down here. Uh, this is hole two uh, angling in, and we've gone through that zone again. Uh, we've seen the quartz veins and black sulfides uh, in two, and then we believe we've hit it again in three uh, based on visuals of the quartz veins and black sulfides. Okay, I'll just uh, window over. We'll take a look at uh, our area here. It's kind of interesting. Um, this is uh, uh, this area here is is the cemetery. So we're we're drilling on both sides of the cemetery. <clears throat> it's quite exciting. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, the whole goal of the night shift was not to wake the dead, and it looks like we were uh, successful. You didn't but, mention uh, the pet cemetery. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's on the other end of the property. It has the makings of a Stephen King novel right here. So this is the 1650 level here and the 1880 level here, the Denver vein coming down. You can see it's got that same geometry as we saw with the Murray vein or the Victor vein and uh, trying to hit that sweet spot in, in between those two levels. Uh, same thing here on the Paymaster vein. Uh, you can see uh, the 1650. 50 and 1800 and again trying to hit that level uh, in here uh, between those two levels. Uh, this, this uh, is, if successful, um, you know, it has a, a lot of strike potential associated with it in that there's basically this is the end of the workings going to the west. So um, we'll see how we did here and then we'll use our projection and our model to step out that uh, 800 meters to the west and see if we can uh, track this thing going west. Uh, here's the Bermuda vein here and the Merton vein coming down. Okay, over here is, uh, this is the core discovery area. 
um, that we talked about earlier. And uh, what we're looking at is uh, our interpretation is that this vein uh, basically rolls over. So we want to come back and uh, looks like all these intercepts from the previous drill holes start to line up when you look at that vein uh, being more, more flattish. So we're going to come in here with our drilling and, and start to look at this vein as if it were flat and uh, try to get down to the right uh, set of rocks as well. Um, okay. And I'm just going to go back uh, to the east here. <clears throat> and we're going to look at uh, this rollover here for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Ohio vein. Uh, there's a big fault uh, to the west, and the offset portion of the Ohio vein has never really been followed up. So uh, what we'll do is uh, follow that to the west. What I'm going to do here now is just turn on our, our drill program. So these are, uh, we've seen the holes that are completed. These are the planned holes. <clears throat> yeah, you can see those core holes over here on the Victor vein. So uh, that'll be to start to fill in and expand that area uh, up to the north. Um, there's our initial hit in that right there with hole one. They can see how we're trying to infill and expand. So this is where we build the volume, where we're, 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 we're getting a sense of widths, we're getting a sense of uh, strikes and grades. Okay. And then we'll go here to, uh, to the west. Uh, there's our hole four. And again, uh, we'll start to come back. And, and here's looking at that flat vein and starting to look at some of these up-dip projections of the veins. And then going to the west, <clears throat> here's where we'll target uh, that uh, zone coming up in a more favorable uh, lithologies. This was a core hole that was completed by Chevron back in the 80s. Uh, they actually had a little bit of gold and silver, but uh, not in the not in the favorable lithologies, which are the West End rhyolite and the, the Mizpah andesite. This was uh, deeper in the Tonopah formation. So uh, we're targeting up dip of that structure where you go through those uh, units. OK, uh, that's all I have. That's it? Come on. That's, it. <laughs> that's pretty good. In exploration terms, this is this is what we call fishing with dynamite. Uh, you know, we, what was most encouraging was uh, you know, the model lined up as predicted on hole one. We found two ultra high grade veins as well. Um, but we've drilled six holes so far uh, and it's predicted in, in all of them. So that's two historic mines. We have the opportunity not just to make one discovery on this small round of drilling we're doing. We're drilling into three historic mines. So maybe we can make three, uh, breathe life into three historic mines plus figure out what's going on with the core discovery. Um, uh, so, yeah, this is going to be a, a wild ride over the next few months, we're hoping. And I'll, I'll hand it over to Jacob. Uh, you're not coming through, Jacob. Can you yeah, hear you me? Go. Okay. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much for that. So we have some questions. Um, first uh, question is, is asking about the financing when the placement uh, will close and uh, if you will have drill results out before that or after that. This is going to be really quick close. We, we said in the news release uh, that we we're targeting to have it closed by, uh, I guess, next Friday. Uh, it's only going to a few people. We were approached with a deal. Uh, it made sense. Obviously, Eric Sprott wants to come in. He's uh, probably the world's biggest silver bug. He liked what we had to do. He approached us uh, with an offer. Uh, it was a value add. We decided to do it. Market seems to like it. Uh, it's not really slowing us down at all because we're planning on batching the next set of results anyways. And you have to understand, too, the the first, uh, I mean, the Victor uh, target is the deepest drilling of the program. So, you know, it's we'll really start to pick up the pace in terms of how many holes get completed per week uh, as we go targets two and four, uh, sorry, three and four. Um, we're through our initial drilling on uh, target two, I guess, but we'll probably hit that again as well. But 
Um, we should have a, a lot of news flow lined up once the financing is complete. Not that many places to track down, so it should be a quick, quick close. Great. Okay. Um, there's a question here asking about some of the, um, the target uh, sizes that you, you have at your various targets, the, the tonnages and, and, and things like that. I'm wondering if you could share uh, the reasoning behind some of those, uh, those targets uh, that you have. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, a lot of it's based on the historic information, right? So, um, so there's a lot of uh, intercompany memos and whatnot talking about uh, uh, the tons and grade, like in, in Area 2 on what's left in the Paymaster and, and Bermuda and Denver veins. So uh, what we've done is we've gone through those, um, pretty much uh, weeded out what we uh, thought was kind of uh, BS and then uh, went in and said, you know, these are what the, the real targets look like and uh, there's a chance here to uh, to double that. And so that's how you end up with that 3 million ounces. There's about uh, a half a million tons per per vein. So that's 1.5. If you can double it, that's 3 million tons. And then you've got the, the grades from the underground working. Use that. That's how we come up with the grade. Yeah, 50 year production profile, you know, it makes it easy to sort of ex uh, extrapolate. We've got access to the the maps of the uh, historic workings. Whole one actually bottomed in historic workings, which weren't even there, which uh, are, are fairly encouraging on our end because they went beyond where we even thought they went. So, um, yeah, there's, you know, it's not a grass, this isn't moose pasture, which we're just, you know, models only as good as the quality of the assumptions going in and how many assumptions you have to make. With this, it's very few and uh, we seem to be connecting the dots. Great, uh, there's a question from online asking uh, what, your, what your drilling cost is uh, in this part of the world. Yeah, so the, the RC uh, drilling uh, all in cost, that would be the drilling, the assays, uh, dirt work people, it's about 65 to $70 per foot. That's about $210 per meter. Okay, so you're you're adding a, a diamond rig uh, presently. I the diamond rig will be coming. Uh, the RC rig is on site. The diamond rig will show up here mid August. And and we're going to be pre collaring the holes too. So the RC rig is going to churn its way down, and then we'll we'll do the 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 core tails at the bottom to go even deeper. Right. Um, another question here asking about holes two and three. Um, and just asking for some clarification that they were drilled before you knew about the new uh, three meter size veins. Is that is that the case? And can you talk about uh, targeting for the core drilling around hole number one? Yeah, so uh, holes uh, one through three were the deepest holes on the property to date. So uh, as an example, hole three went, uh, to, uh, well, what is it, uh, 24, 55 feet deep. I'm not going to do the math for the conversion right now, but uh, anyway, uh, you know, a little over 700 meters. Uh, we did those in succession just because uh, we're on the north side of the highway. So yeah, we had holes one, uh, two. We released assays for one, holes two and three are in the lab. And what kind of turnaround are you getting from the lab these days? It's between 20 and 25 business days. Okay. So, you know, say four to six weeks. Right. Um, and holes, you said holes two and three were already sent? Yes. Yeah. So uh, we're now fairly late in, in July, so we might see those kind of mid to late August? Uh, we should see them by mid-August at the latest. Okay, great. Um, just curious, you talked a bit about some of the underground workings. Um, are, are those all basically flooded at present? Uh, we, we don't know. Um, there was an attempt to go down and, and uh, look at the workings with a drone uh, through some of the shafts, but uh, they didn't get too far. There's, uh, you know, people uh, see an open hole and have the opportunity to throw uh, dead bodies and an old car <laughs> on the hole. So uh, there's a lot of junk down there. So between that and the cemeteries we're drilling into, it's there, there, there's no reason not to be a little skittish. <laughs> 
Right. Okay. And did you say that in hole number one, you actually encountered some underground workings that were not previously mapped? Right. So we bottomed the hole in some old workings. Um, we, you know, we had access to uh, to the uh, a set of maps. Uh, obviously, we were missing uh, a set somewhere below the 1880 level. It looks like uh, some kind of development on the foot wall, but uh, the zone is well above where we went through the workings. So, right. Um, not sure what they were doing down there, but they were there are workings. But they're Do not. They're not on the zone. Do you know roughly how much uh, distance there is in underground workings? Uh, in the whole district, there's over 500 miles of working. And, and on your package? Uh, that, I haven't figured that out. I don't know. But. Okay. One of the things I get asked uh, a fair bit about this story is, um, why wasn't this being explored actively more recently than just now? That's a great question, and, and I think it has to do with, if you look at the history of, uh, say, the gold mining industry in Nevada and, and, and the market. So uh, back in the 80s and 90s, particularly in the 90s, people paid a lot of money for mining stocks based on the good stories they would tell, and the good stories were all surrounding large bulk tonnage, open pit, heat leach type uh, deposits. And if you look, um, you know, a lot of those things were discovered. People really weren't interested in narrow vein mining. And, and I, I think people like high grades, but they weren't really interested in narrow vein mining. And so it's only been in the last, say, uh, I'll say five years where people have uh, kind of lost their shirts on big bulk tonnage, open pit, low grade gold mines and have really started to think, Maybe grade is important, not just the number of ounces that you have. Mm -hmm. And well, there's a quality uh, concept there, right? So the reason Tonopah has been bypassed, I believe, is because people saw it as a narrow vein mine target. Um, you know, you've got some, uh, uh, you, you got the town surrounding you. But what, what I can tell you is our experience with, uh, you know, drilling behind the Chevron station and next to the cemetery is uh, people come by and they're really excited because they see if uh, if it's successful, it could mean something really big for Tonopah. It, right. It's pretty incredible that the, the uh, I mean, there's literally a mining museum, like, you, you know, a walking distance from everything. Our first, our first hole was drilled and I, I, I posted the photo of it with the head frame in the background. The fact that no one's ever targeted this, one of the largest silver primary districts in North America, that averaged at over two kilograms per ton. Anytime we're reporting precious metals uh, uh, recoveries at two kilograms per ton, I'd say, you know, it's worth a couple holes, um, but part of the secret sauce here is, is what, you know, the exploration. The other half was a consolidation. This is as much a real estate play, getting these claims put back together, getting these parcels put back together so that a meaningful program could be done. And, and, yeah, I mean, you know, the fact we connected as modeled on the first hole, I mean, shows opportunities do exist. I mean, the fact that our stock sold down after we announced this project shows that opportunities do exist. It, this has been hiding in plain sight for a better part of 100 years. Right. It, it follows on uh, very well to the, the next question, uh, which was how long did it take for, I guess it's the LE royalty guys, uh, to, to put the package of land together that you guys have now in Black Rock Gold? Well, I, I, I can say that the parcel as we got lasted on the market for one day. When they got it, we signed a, it was a multi-party deal. We, this parcel uh, brought together Ely's uh, portion that they had to core mining, which represented the, the greenfield target. And then it brought another private individuals uh, uh, th that had taken decades to consolidate these other claims, which are targets, the, the historic mines on here, which are targeting. And that we, we, the day that we got the deal was the first time in history that this package has been consolidated as one. Ever. Um, ever, yeah. No one, this, we've got multiple uh, mining companies, historic mining companies. And back then there was even lots of consolidation. In Tonopah, I mean, there's books written about Tonopah. Uh, there was, you know, quite a few individual mining companies. The Tonopah Extension Company, uh, uh, who had Victor and uh, our target, our second target, 
that uh, the lead shareholder and that was Charles Schwab. He personally financed the, the building of the mill. Uh, Wyatt Earp came and set up a bar on the property. Uh, you had so many cool people coming through town. I mean, the history of this district. Hotel. It, it, well, yeah. So Tonopah itself has uh, the, the number one rated haunted uh, hotel in all of America. And it also happens to be the stargazing capital of the world too, or of, of America too. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of history there. As I said, Howard Hughes came in in the 1960s. He came and recall, consolidated a lot of the project. It wasn't, um, uh, it didn't have the exact uh, packages and claims we had, but it had a good portion of them. Um, but he never ended up doing anything. Uh, j just as soon as he came, he left. Uh, this is towards the end of his life. He actually had his second marriage done at the hotel in Tonopah to a movie star uh, uh, used to be hitchhiking along that highway as well. So uh, there's a lot of uh, cool things, but I feel Charles Schwab, Howard Hughes, and Bill Howell, it makes sense. <laughs> Great. Um, well, there's one uh, one question here from, from a participant who wants to ask why you raised an additional seven and a half million only a month after uh, raising the nine million dollars. Uh, proof of concept. On our first hole, we've got a proof of concept. Anytime you get a second drill rig going, uh, you're effectively doubling your, your expenditure. Uh, and listen, this is now we can say we're fully financed. Um, you know, we knew that Eric Sprott had other value adds. I mean, listen, uh, most times you announce a finance uh, financing with a discount to market, your your stock sells down to that level. Uh, in this case, our stock's up uh, uh, 30 cents and cents, so about 40%. Um, it's a no-brainer. Uh, he's not, you know, this isn't a widely placed financing where it's going to be lots of people cycling through their positions to get back in. Eric's not selling. He's a big silver bug. He's got value add. It's a vote of confidence, and the market liked it. So, you know, uh, we're open to any offers, and and I think Bill and I have discussed this. If anyone wants to approach us with an offer between one percent and a hundred percent of the company, do it. You know, <laughs> well, we'll discuss it. But uh, with Eric, yeah, we saw value in it. Market likes it, and yeah, we can put that money to good use. We didn't raise nine million the last raise. It was only four and a half million. Right. Yeah. We we're also got 3,500 meters of drilling uh, lined up for uh, Silver Cloud, our, our grassroots project up in northern Nevada, and that's going to be an exciting program. We're we're doing um, uh, drilling targeting our northeast veins target, which is another discovery Bill made or future discovery, but uh, where it's effectively directly adjacent to Hollister. The vein system in Hollister runs east-west. Uh, those veins, which produced at uh, I believe it was 34 gram per ton head grade. Uh, we're mined pretty much right up to our property. Uh, we're right west of them, and on the west side of that property, we've got a mercury mine uh, and eight veins are cropping at surface, and no one's ever put a single drill hole in that. We're going to light that up with 10 to 12 holes uh, uh, coming up in a couple months here. Uh, it's not going to be an expensive treasure hunt, but if we can figure out the western extension of the Hollister deposit, uh, it's a worthy uh, it, it, it's a worthy endeavor. I'm glad you brought that up. I was just going to ask about that. Do, do, would you add another drill to go there? Would you move the RC drill you have at Tonopah West? No, uh, we uh, we contracted another rig to go there in September. Okay. So uh, that's uh, roughly a million dollar program uh, up at Northeast Spain. Yeah, it's it's Tonopah has already established itself, and I don't see the rig leaving anytime soon, to be honest. So there's always going to be constant news flow. Tonopah is clearly the value driver now. I mean, you've got a brownfield target with historic production uh, that, you know, we know that historic miners didn't shut it down because they thought they ran out of good stuff or joy. They shut it down uh, because of metals prices and debts and World War One and a plethora of other reasons. So. That's the value driver. That's the uh, steak and potatoes. Uh, if we can, if we can figure out Silver Cloud, which uh, is a massive opportunity at the top of the single largest gold mining complex in the world, with multiple mercury mines, that's covered in sinter, uh, that's been had limited drilling in three different areas and cut gold in three different areas, none of which have ever been followed up. Plus a, th a fourth target, which Bill discovered, which is next to one of the highest grade gold mines in the world when it was in his heyday. Yeah, we'll 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 put a million dollars Canadian into that and see what we get. 
Great. Uh, maybe one more quick question because we're running up on sort of 50 minutes here, but uh, a very common one and, and but certainly worthwhile addressing. Uh, uh, one of our participants asking if there's much COVID-19 impact for you guys in, in uh, Tone of well, at, at Bill's age, he's the one that has to worry about this. So, Bill, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, the biggest impact is all the bars are closed. Uh, <laughs> expiration. It, it, it's not a labor-intensive endeavor, what we're doing. Uh, there, are, there are protocols in place, um, but it's, uh, you, you know, we're, it, it's not like there's hundreds of people at our site. It's, uh, it's a small team, um, and, and Bill... Uh, you know, th th we'd have other issues if Bill was getting close enough to have communities spread with him. So, great. Okay. Well, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll halt it here. Um, I want to sincerely thank both Andrew and and Bill for their their presentation, especially the the 3D aspect of it. Uh, uh, that helped a lot in 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 showing what these veins are doing at depth. I also want to thank uh, audience members for taking the time to participate. Uh, our next webinar is our Summer Silver Conference starting noon on Tuesday that will include 13 silver companies with a keynote presentation from Pan American Silver and will also include uh, First Majestic Silver. And of course, uh, Black Rock Gold will be uh, attending that as well. Uh, to see the full list of companies and to register, please visit our website at www.redcloudfs.com. We hope to see you all there. And uh, thank you, Bill and Andrew. Thank you very much. It was great to be here.